Welcome into another edition of the Gigam 24-7 Sports Podcast. I am Andrew Hattersley, joined by Carter Carls, Texas A&M, and Arkansas, set to meet in the Southwest Classic, potentially for the last time at AT&T Stadium this weekend on Saturday at 2.30 p.m. And to get ready for the Razorbacks, we can think of no better person to have on to, to get everything we need to know about Arkansas than Trey Biddy from hogsports.com. Trey, thanks so much for joining us. Of course. Appreciate you guys having me. Fresh off your own, um, off your own show earlier today yep. as well. Got to, got to ask you because I think this has been kind of one of the big talking points. It feels like for the last couple of years was this potentially being the last game at AT and T Stadium. A and M fans have been pretty vocal about it. Arkansas fans have been pretty vocal about it. How do you how do how do you feel like fans are feel Arkansas fans are feeling about it? it feels like both fans are mm-hmm. kind of ready to get back to campuses. How do they feel about it? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a mixed bag, but most people in the bag, I think, are ready for this series to move somewhere else. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Arkansas fans in Dallas who like, you know, just being able to pop over and go to a game real easy and watch their Hogs yeah. play. Obviously, they probably would like to see it continue, but uh, it's no secret that this series has not been very kind to Arkansas. You know, this was a yeah. series, uh, what was it, like 42, 20, 41, 24, and three, I think, before Texas A&M joined the SEC, and now it's like 42, 35, and three. So it's it's changed a lot, and this venue just hasn't been very good. The first three years they played there with Bobby Petrino as head coach, Arkansas went three and zero, and then ever since it's uh, one and it's one and eleven. Is that the number? I think so. I think it's one and yeah. eleven. So that plays a part of it for Arkansas. Uh, you know, and I just think maybe it's gotten a little bit stale, just the same teams, the same venue every single year, you know. Um, I don't think it's necessarily good for recruiting for either team, even though Arkansas has said, you know, it's good to get exposure from Dallas area recruits and stuff. Um, you know, Texas a and bringing recruits to this game, but they're not – they can't talk to them. <laughs> they can't right. exactly. show them the campus. They can't show them facilities, you know, that kind of stuff. So yeah. uh, I, I don't think it's a great thing for recruiting. It also – the schedule is just – it hurts Arkansas a lot scheduling wise because you've got, um, you know, you've got, well, Arkansas has played one game in Fayetteville to this point. That's crazy. We're, we're on week five and this is one game in Fayetteville because yeah. they also play a game at War Memorial stadium in Little Rock. I just, I think there's a competitive disadvantage there also. So, um, and me personally, I just, it's a really nice press box, but it's so high up that yeah. I just feel like I'm watching ants play football and I end up watching the big screen anyway. You do. Yeah, Trey. The only thing I like about it at this point is the mac and cheese in that press box. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. They do you what? Well, they do you right as far as food and drink. They do. Sure. <laughs> well, Trey, you know, going into this season, uh, Sam Pittman, obviously one of the names you hear pop up on the hot seat talk. Um, I know last year you you were kind of asking him like, hey, what what's some momentum? What's some things you can do this off season to kind of, you know have more promise going into the 2024 season. I'm just kind of wondering how you feel like he did over the off season and, and so far just what he's done and, and maybe what kind of finish he needs to have to kind of inspire some, some confidence among the fan base. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people expected change as the season was coming to a close last year. And then we're wondering like, okay, they're going to keep Sam it could get very toxic, as you know, in the off season when you keep a guy that most people think is on his way out. I don't know that they could have done anything other than hiring Bobby. Pet- like literally, I don't know if there's another hire other than hiring Bobby Petrino. Just the way people in Arkansas feel about him uh, and his offense, the success he had at Arkansas in the past. Uh, so that was uh, a big move for them, and you know they produced pretty well on offense. Um, but you know, winning games like this is going to go a long way. Like losing that Oklahoma State game. Uh, there was a, a statistic put out that teams that had put up 550 yards and outpaced their opponent by like 200 yards uh, were 327 and one since 2020. And Arkansas is the only team that l- was the loser. And the average score is like 53 13, but Arkansas seemed to find a way to lose that game. And that's kind of been a trend with Pittman at Arkansas. They've lost a ton of one score games. It's like, uh, I think he's 12. Out of 12, I think he's he's lost 10 of them, 10, 10 of the last 12 one-score games. Um, that's not a very good number. And then it happened again against Oklahoma State, and you're just like, okay, you know, the trend continues. So uh, that's a big part of it. He's got to figure out a way to win those one-score games. And 
also games like this against Texas A and M. I mean, I think Mike Elko is a really good coach. I had him on our coaching search hot board twice, and you know, Arkansas fans kind of scoffed at the idea because he was a, just a defensive coordinator, wasn't a sitting head coach at the time. Uh, but I had him during the Chad Moore search, and then uh, during the last one with, with Pittman. Uh, but I also don't think you can judge a coach by his first year. If you did that, then Nick Saban is a subpar coach, and. Steve Sarkeesian is not a very good coach and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so I think it's hard to judge a coach by year one, but I do think that he, he is a good coach. Uh, but it's also his first year, and they're most likely going to start a redshirt freshman quarterback. Uh, that's an opportunity that you have to take advantage of if you're Arkansas and Sam Pittman, uh, where they have a more veteran uh, group like, you know, with – um, with Taylor Green also starting at quarterback, who's an older guy. Uh, so that's something that you have to take advantage of. Um, and Arkansas hasn't done that in the past against Texas A&M, whether it's uh, Allen or uh, who's a sophomore, I guess, first-year starter, true sophomore, Kellen Mond, um, Kenny Hill. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of – Johnny Manziel, I guess, maybe would be a different type of uh, – example to point to but um you got to take advantage when you're facing redshirt freshman quarterback in a program that's starting over both culturally and with a new coach um you you got to win those games in the sec and arkansas just hasn't done a good job of doing that when they've had opportunities dre you mentioned the big name there bobby petrino obviously going to be one of the big storylines heading into this game given his time as the a&m offense coordinator now back in um back with the razorbacks what what has he brought to the program through the first couple of months he's been on the job? And do you, does it give Arkansas maybe a little bit of an advantage over A&M given his experience mm -hmm. in College Station? Yeah, I think there are a few things that you would look at and say maybe this gives Arkansas a little bit of an edge. That would be one of them going back and uh, facing a team that he coached at last year. And, and Petrino has said, you know, not just like blatantly, but he's indicated that he was very handcuffed. Uh, by Jimbo Fisher last year. I don't know why you would handcuff a guy like that who is one of the best offensive coordinators in the country, but um, that's one reason probably one of the decisions that Jimbo made that landed him where he is right now. Uh, a very rich man, but an un unemployed man. Uh, so I think that's probably going to play a bit of a factor with Petrino, but it, in, what it, in Arkansas it instilled a lot of confidence. Players love talking about Petrino and how he teaches the offense. And uh, for fans, it's kind of like, uh, you know how you never like saw the downfall of like Marilyn Monroe because you know she passed away and you know you never she we have this memory of her uh, as being this certain thing you know and um, it's kind of the same way with with Petrino we we never saw a downfall you know it, it ended abruptly and we never saw like the offense you know fail to produce or anything like that so people's idea of Petrino is that he can do like no wrong and so there's a, a bit of confidence that he's instilled not only with the players but also with the fans that's one aspect of an edge that I, you know an intangible type of edge I think you could give to Arkansas I also yeah. think it's important to note that Arkansas's leading passer leading rusher and leading receiver are all from the Dallas area and this is probably you know they, Arkansas didn't get a whole lot of opportunities to play in Texas so this is a game that I think would mean a lot to those guys also and playing in front of, you know, what's going to be a lot of people in the crowd. Not that Texas A&M doesn't have a lot of play people from that area. It's just that it's a more unique experience for Arkansas playing in the state of Texas, particularly in Dallas. Yeah, Trey, you know, this offseason getting Taylor Green, Jaquindon Jackson out of the portal, uh, that, did you expect them to be as good as they've been so far this year? Like what were kind of the expectations? And mm -hmm. and then what's just kind of impressed you about those two guys in particular? Well, with Jaquindon, I could tell – you could tell pretty early that he was going to be a, a really good workhorse type of back. He's got – he's got a real attitude <laughs> about him. They're going to kind of chip on your shoulder. Like he's got something to prove, not just to himself, but to you also. Uh, I can remember in the spring, I asked him, he had a, he had a 15 yard catch in a scrimmage for a touchdown. I said, Hey, that was a really nice catch. You didn't have a lot of catches last year. Can you tell me what happened? He's like, yeah, people don't think I can catch the ball. It's like I, people, people think I have stone hands, but I can catch the ball, you know. And then I uh, asked him, uh, somebody asked him about, uh, no, I asked him about his injury last year, playing through injury. You showed a lot of toughness, had an ankle injury all year. Yeah, people think I'm injury prone. It's like people don't think I can stay healthy. You know, he kind of just turns everything around to where it's me against you. Or somebody said, hey, you're kind of a power back or something. I'm not a power back. I'm versatile. You know, so he, he kind of has that mentality and you see it on the field. He he does a really good job of getting those first four yards and then worrying about the rest after that. Uh, I believe he's leading the SEC in rushing right now. Uh, he's got to do a little bit better in pass protection. As Bobby Petrino always says, you got to if you can't pass, bro, you can't play for me. Uh, and he's whiffed on a couple of uh, of 
opportunities, I guess, for defensive players to where they've gotten to tail and green. Green, to me, like what I saw in the spring was a guy that would be have great days throwing the ball and then guy would, one day would just be really inconsistent. Like, where is he throwing this? And we've seen that a little bit these last couple of games. I always felt like his legs would be there. He reminded me a lot of Matt Jones uh, in term, not in the way that he's built necessarily, although he's very tall like Matt was, uh, but – just that he he's a long strider and people take really bad angles on him and he can gobble up 10 yards so fast, like a couple of steps and he's, you know, 10 yards down the field and people just take really poor angles on him. And that's one, one reason he's been so effective. He's probably like a four or five guy in the 40 uh, and he'll pick up some yards that way against Texas A&M on Saturday. But what we're also seeing is that he struggles sometimes throwing the ball, and I think he's gotten a little bit of a little bit trigger shy. Uh, he's at forty four percent completion percentage uh, in the last game, was like forty two the year the game before that against UAB. Uh, late finding receivers, uh, and I think sometimes sees receivers open but questions it. And a couple of times he's long, left receivers hanging out to dry. He he threw a lot better, obviously against UAPB in the opener. Through, I thought pretty well against uh, Oklahoma State. He was 57%, but he, you know, when they needed a play, he made the play for them. Um, so that's kind of like what we're seeing with him. Like he's got to pick it up in the passing game. If he, if he can get to 60% completion percentage, then he's going to be really, really dangerous because of his legs. Sticking with kind of tail and green and the, and that Arkansas offense looked really explosive, like you mentioned at times, and then had some troubles with turnovers as well as, as mm -hmm. well so far. What have you seen in kind of that duality and, and what what are kind of maybe some of the issues that have plagued them in, the, in that regard? With the turnovers, um, yeah. you know, he's just made he's just made some bad throws. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's uh, he, he is not he is. I, I just feel like he has lost a little bit of confidence uh, throwing yeah. the ball. And I don't know what that stems from, but early he was throwing guys open. And now it yeah. seems like a guy will just be standing there and he'll scramble around and then find him, you know, way late uh, in the process. So uh, I, 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 it's a good question. He doesn't miss guys low. He just – he sails it sometimes. He's had – I think one ball was tipped in the air. Um, but yeah. he's – and he was he was hit one time uh, on a throw, which would have been a wide open wide receiver. They would have gone up, you know, 17 to 21 points on Oklahoma State if he had not thrown that pick six where he was hit when he was throwing the ball. But Arkansas's offensive line also has to do a better job protecting him. That's another uh, yeah. factor. And it's not just him. As I mentioned, Jaquin and Jackson's had a couple of whiffs um, that turned into sacks also. But uh, Arkansas revamped things on the offensive line, new offensive line coach, three new players from the transfer portal who are all starting. Uh, and they've done a great job paving the way in the run game. And they're way better than last year's offensive line, but still overall, to me, performing like, slightly below average SEC offensive line. And a lot of that is because they've given up nine sacks. Last year, I believe it was a record 47 sacks given up last year uh, with that offensive line. And I think about how many times K.J. Jefferson shut tacklers and, and you know, just slipped out of tackles. And this year they've given up nine. So they're not on pace to what they were last year, but it's, you know, it's pretty close. So they've got to improve pass protection. That's definitely been um, a cause for concern and one reason why they've had some turnovers. Sure, I was going to ask about the O line, but I'll, I'll turn it over to the other side of the ball. Uh, mm -hmm. This Arkansas run defense, 14th nationally right now. How much of that it's just hey, they've played Arkansas Pine Bluff and Auburn doesn't have a quarterback or doesn't have a you know court, very, very good quarterback, and maybe Ollie Gordon's been struggling, or or have they been a, a good run defense? And what are you expecting from that group against mm -hmm. a, a rushing attack that? you know, had some success against them last year, but also has been pretty good this season. Yeah, Moss ran for 100 yards against them last year, and this year they're bringing a dual-threat quarterback into the equation who can obviously pick up some, some yards on the ground. It is a very veteran front. Uh, overall, especially on the defensive line with Landon Jackson and Cam Ball, Eric Gregory, uh, Anton Junkaj is a four-star transfer who's in his sixth year. Uh, Nico Davier has been in the program for a few years also and has played uh, each of those years at defensive end. So they've got some veterans on the defensive line. They did a really good job bottling up Ollie Gordon in that Oklahoma State game. Um, and, you know, against uh, against uh, Auburn also, they they performed really well. I think they're averaging like 82 yards a game given up on, on the ground, which is – which is solid. And now last year's team through uh, four games was given up, I think, 89 yards per game. They ended up giving up like 154 average. So uh, it went up a lot. Now, a lot of that was 
letting go of the rope those last two SEC games. They gave up 350-something yards against Auburn and 250-something against Missouri as they just kind of kind of quit. You know, a lot of people worrying about where they're going to play next year, if their coach is going to be hired. You guys know how that goes. Uh, so yeah. that kind of skews the numbers a little bit. But they were a really strong run defense last year. Uh, I like their linebacker core. What I noticed in the spring was, like, they're trying to figure out different ways to get more linebackers on the field. And that's usually a good indicator that they feel good about that group, especially when you know what they have on the defensive line. So um, I, I, th I just think they've got a, a, a solid front seven. Uh, Xavier Sori was a five-star recruit, uh, Georgia transfer. Um, you know, um, Stephen Dix, who started the last game at linebacker, was a uh, uh, former starter at Florida State uh, before he went to Marshall and then to Arkansas. Uh, so, you know, they've got some guys that are that are talented in that front seven. Trey wanted to ask you about TJ Metcalf and um, has 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 got off to a really nice start to the year. What have you seen from him, and what what do what do you think's allowed him to kind of take that step forward and and become a real playmaker in the secondary for for the Razorbacks? Yeah, well, he's got really good bloodlines. Obviously, uh, yeah. There's Metcalf name carries some weight. Uh, he to me, based on what I've seen so far, I think he's the best safety that Arkansas has had maybe since Jalen Catalan. Um, he's uh, and Catalan's still playing college football. He's at UNLV now. He was at Arkansas and then Texas. Now UNLV He's just about a lot of injuries. Yeah. But he was so good as a redshirt freshman at Arkansas uh, when he was healthy. They don't win that game against Auburn without T.J. Metcalf. Like, I, you yeah. see – guys get named defensive player of the week and you're like, oh, that's kind of surprising. Or they have, you know, some some kind of backdoor stats like sacks and stuff like that 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 earn them that honor. But uh there's never been a more deserve there maybe equally deserving players for defensive player of the week. There's never been one that's more deserving in my opinion. He had two interceptions against Auburn. Uh one of them was not an inter or one uh, play he made was not an interception, but he tipped the ball and then it was intercepted by Danico Slaughter. I think that was Auburn's first yeah. series. He also there was a what would have been a touchdown run, and he comes back and 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 strips the ball from the running back, and it's recovered in the end zone by Arkansas. Uh, so he saved a touchdown there. He also had some more pass deflections and tackles. Obviously, uh, I just thought he played a phenomenal game, and in his home state of Alabama. Uh, so you know Hudson Clark has been kind of a staple in Arkansas secondary. He's caught a lot of flack from Arkansas fans because he's been kind of, you know, hit or miss sometimes, yeah. but he's always – nobody's beating him out uh, year after year. And then, you know, here comes T.J. Metcalf, who's just a second-year player and beats out Clark, who's a six-year senior uh, for that safety spot. And, you know, Clark has kind of moved around from nickel to safety, kind of filling in all those spots as a top backup. But um, Metcalf has been a really nice addition on the back end for the Hogs in an area of which was going into the season kind of a, you know, how good are they going to be in the secondary? Because you felt pretty good about their front seven, but the secondary was, you know, a little bit of a concern in terms of depth and stuff. Mm -hmm. So Metcalf's emergence has been really big for him. Trey, my bad. I think I went out j just a second, but um, I'll, I'll jump back in and, okay. and add, ask you just going in this game, you know, when you look at it, Arkansas, how do they win this game? How do they lose this game? Uh, maybe maybe you could say it's the, the same old song and dance with Arkansas where can't beat itself. We've seen that mm -hmm. time and again. But but what do you kind of see as how do they win? How do they lose? Yeah, well, our guy, uh, Connor Goodson, had – and one of his keys to victory is like Arkansas can't wear white helmets because they're zero and four against Texas A and M in white helmets and <laughs> two and twelve overall, <laughs> so not a good number. And they wore white helmets last year. Uh, but in all seriousness, I think that uh, you know Jeff Tarpley, I thought on our show made a good point that Texas A and M over the years is just a lot of times in what seven games that have been decided by a score or less. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas A and M's just made one more play than Arkansas has. And so that's that's something that you have to remember. Like, there's been times where Arkansas has just lost the game, you know, just giving it away in a lot of ways. There was uh, the Dan Skipper tripping incident where um, Arkansas was about to go up 17 in the fourth quarter, and they get called for the only tripping penalty in SEC play all year. <laughs> um, the KJ Jefferson deciding he can be Superman and dive from 12 feet out at the goal line, you know, in a yeah. completely momentum swinging game. So it's just sometimes one play that'll get you. So obviously turnovers, penalties, special teams, and injuries all play a key factor in every single game in the SEC. So those are categories that you've got to do better than uh, uh, Texas A&M. Last year, I don't think Arkansas had a single penalty and still lost the game. Um, lost on special teams, had a big uh, punt return, I believe, for a touchdown also in that one. So there were, there were components of those you know, factors uh, that played a role in it. So, 
to me, it's like you've got to take advantage of and, – and Reed's a good quarterback. I'm not saying that. Like he's a guy that can get it done. And we've seen Texas A&M yeah. start freshman quarterbacks before against Arkansas. Uh, but you have to – rattle that guy you have to make him question himself you have to take advantage of his inexperience and uh because you don't get a lot of uh, opportunities to face a freshman quarterback in the sec so that's i think that's a really key part of this game can they rattle uh marcel reed in this one and on the other side of the ball don't make stupid mistakes i mean because it seems like every single time Arkansas plays texas a&m there's something like that happens whether it's you know the 12 foot a diving attempt into the end zone uh, or giving up a punt return, something like that that's a little more common. So those those kinds of things can't happen, um, those big momentum swinging games. But I, I think it's going to be a really close game uh, no matter who wins. Trey, final one for you kind of on a fun note is I even if I can't catch an Arkansas game, i got to be honest, I will – I make sure to tune in for your walk and talks after the game to kind of get your get the the feedback and, and your take after the game. I know Carter does something similar in homage of you now because of of you know the gigum after party. Uh, mm-hmm. Where where did that idea kind of come from for Texas A and like for Texas A and fans to learn a little more about it? Where did that idea come from, and just what's it been like kind of doing that over the years? Yeah, I you know I started. I remember I did something like that when we moved from Rivals to 24-7. I did like yeah. a, just a cut-up, though, of me walking around around you know the stadium and different areas around Razorback football talking about the changeover. Uh, I used to do stand-ups in the middle of the field after games, and I would always find myself kind of grabbing the tripod and like you know pointing to stuff. And I don't know, one day I, I actually it was the Belk Bowl in 20, was that 2017. Uh, I was going to walk from – the stadium to my hotel and I was going to do it because I was kind of rushed for time. It was getting late. And yeah. I ended up also just kind of thinking, well, I mean, it's dark outside and I don't really know the way back to my hotel. So this could get a little <laughs> dicey. So I ended up doing it in the hotel room. Uh, I don't know. I just, I think one day I just decided I was going to do it. I don't know that there was, and I, I had done stuff like walking with the camera a little bit before, but nothing, nothing yeah. like that. And I think one day I think I decided I was just going to get a selfie stick and, walked to my car. And when I did it, I, the response was just overwhelming. Like the, the amount of people that just loved, uh, and also when I was, I really first started doing it, it was 2019 and Arkansas really sucked. And I was kind of pissed about the state of the program. I thought it was ridiculous. And, you know, people I think like to see me angry. Um, so it just really, it just took off from there. And, uh, yeah, it's, exceeded my expectations obviously but I, I just find also you know when i do radio because i do it remotely i do a 20 minute segment every day and i've always walked i've always just put my headphones on you know use their app and i, I walk around basically in a circle and i yeah. for some reason my thoughts just kind of pour out of me and every time i'm done with it i'm like man that sucked people aren't going to like that and people love it so i just keep doing it I was going to say, it's excellent work. I really enjoy listening to it. I'll be honest with you. I think Carter, Carter does as well. Trey, thank you so much for, for taking a few minutes to visit with us. Safe travels down to yeah. down to Texas this weekend, and um, always appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys.